All right. Sounds like some exciting weekends we have had. Um, yeah, welcome, welcome. I'm so glad to be here again. Um, I just couldn't keep myself away. I'm just, um, I'm just really excited to just expand on the message I uh, shared last week. There's just so much in the passage that um, we looked at, and just even though I'm not going to be able to fully go through it today as well, um, I really part of my heart to ex- yeah, just expand on these few points. Last week we looked at Acts um, and just the, the beginning, the beginnings of church as we know it, the the body of Christ and all of that. Um, and I started looking at Jesus and the path he walked with the disciples, you know, getting rough and tough with the different personality types and then different backgrounds and just the community they had and how that sort of built up to the crucifixion and, you know, the bringing in of the new covenant um, and how Jesus tells him, to, tells him to just wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the new covenant, which is the Holy Spirit. And we see, you know, the day of Pentecost comes, the, the, there's like all that sound and commotion within Jerusalem. A bunch of people are, are there from around the country, around the world. And, you know, Peter stands up. He has the Holy Spirit within him and he gives a powerful sermon. Or at least I believe it's powerful because 3,000 new Christians get born that day. And those are like... Out of 120 that were waiting in the upper room, it was 3,000 that just burst from those seams. And we just see, like, in how, yeah, how they choose to live their lives after that, which was just to, you know, just come into community, come in so close to each other, you know, just selling things to create provision for one another and, um, yeah, and just devoting themselves to the apostles and the teachings and just, just so eager for something and, it's just so beautiful to see. And then we, from there, we stemmed on to you know, just how important it is to break bread in one another's homes, like within our modern context of Cape Town. You know, our flats are so small. Like, you, you stand up too quick and you hit the roof. And it's like you kind of need to motion around each other in the kitchen. And it's like there's no space for community here. We go for coffees, we go for walks, and we, we do all these things outside of our homes, but... When, as soon as we step outside of our door, we just put up at least three different shields. We're no longer vulnerable. But once we're in our homes and we share a meal together, we just become vulnerable and we see each other for who we are and we build connection. We've, God made us for connection with, with one another. And you just end up being so lonely with, surrounded by people if you just don't have that connection. We just, yeah, just spoke how important it is to break bread in our home. We have a lot of really nice bakeries in Cape Town, so you can get some really nice bread. And it's like so, yeah, just reminding us of how important it is to sit around a table or on the floor if you don't have a table, and just connect. And yeah, uh, like Julie had mentioned, we have yeah, um, Homey Sunday coming up next week. So just keep that in mind. Chairs are not a priority. Yeah. And also just how within community, it's, it's a, such an awesome way of providing, of creating provision. You know, we often have excess in one area and lack in another. And within community, you can see, hey, Johnny needs a toaster. And you have an extra toaster. And you can kind of lend and give where, where, the, where you see need. And um, yeah, it's such a, such a beautiful way of doing it within relationship of a community where it's no longer about a hand-me-down or it's like I'm doing charity and I'm, here's my one contribution to society and moving on, it's a, no, I, I give to a brother and a sister in need and it's, it builds relationship and it builds the church. Yeah, and it's just those relational aspects are so important. Um, I would like to really look at Acts 2. Uh, we can get the slide up. I'll read it for us. What's it say? Okay, awesome. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and the, and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were, at, oh, were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. 
And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the number day by day those who were being saved. So I just want to relook at that verse 42, which is, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. Oh, that third word there, devoted. Such an interesting word. We might often glance over it and be like, ah, devoted, they, they're pretty committed. I'm pretty devoted to my, um, my soapies, uh, pretty devoted to my bread making or pretty devoted to my running. It's, it's something we glance over. Devotion is such a, it's a strong word. It's a very emotive. The Greek word for devoted, if we go to the third slide, is that. <laughs> now, if we've done math, we know the first symbol, which is pi, but that is not how this is pronounced. If we look at the third line, can we say it together so I don't look, so don't look stupid? Okay, one, two, three. Pros, And that means to continue to do something with intense effort. And it's implied that it's done despite difficulty. So they continued to do something with intense effort despite difficulty. They continued to devote themselves in the apostles' teachings and fellowship. Despite difficulty, they broke bread and devoted themselves to prayer. They continued on. We see here they had favor with all. And verse 47, but if you like move on a chapter and you see it turns so quickly. The world begins to hate Christians so quickly after that. And they devoted themselves to the teachings. That's, that's what I want to look at today, just that idea of devoting ourselves to teachings. So, who were they? Um, I want to retouch on this a bit. These were foreigners, locals, and pilgrims. These were a mixed bag of people. Pentecost happened around the, um, uh, yeah, the Feast of Weeks, I believe it's called. Uh, another word for it, or the Jewish word is Shavuot. I think I butchered that terribly. Shavuot. Shavuot? I don't know. Um, this typically happened 50 days after Passover, which is actually really fantastic because there's so many, sim- so much symbolism that happens around this. Um, it's so, it signified the conclusion of the grain harvest. Normally, you, at the start of Passover, you would you'd start your barley and your um, good barley, and then you would eventually move on to your wheat and you would and, and your grains, and you would end it on that day. And then you would bring your proceeds, you would bring your, your 10%, and you would worship God with that 10%. It was essentially your first fruits. And with the Holy Spirit coming in on that day, it's like the first fruits of God's new covenant. Although some, there's a lot of debates around it, a lot of people believe that the day of Passover, or sorry, Pentecost, is actually the day that Moses came down from the mountain with the Torah, with the first covenant. So with the Holy Spirit coming in on Pentecost, he actually brought the second covenant to fulfill the first covenant on the same day. Just such a beautiful round circle. So yes, like I mentioned, these are foreigners, locals, and pilgrims. These, these are people coming around the, from around the world. This is one of the three like, almost obligatory, um, semi-forced pilgrimages to Jerusalem that they have per year. And... People from around the world kind of came, came there. It's, it was probably a bit harsh if they moved a bit further. They were like, ah, that, that plot of land, just, you know, 10, 20 k's that way. It looks really cool. But they moved further away from Jerusalem. They probably regretted it. They're like, ah, shucks, that's an extra day of walking. But it's, um, everyone came together in Jerusalem. This is like vastly different people. And they gather, gather there. And it's, imagine just sort of like bustling and walking around and you, you're walking in, I don't know, maybe Canal Walk and you just, you, hear, like you see something really interesting happening in that one store and some guys like dancing, other people are like saying different, or speaking different languages, say you've, you've visited from overseas and all of a sudden you hear your language or your, your spoken tongue for the first time, you're like, oh, what's that? You start to gather around whatever this place is, and you're like, everyone's also like curious, like, what's happening? They're like, some people are saying, no, they're drunk. Some people are saying, no, they're just uh, foolish. Other 
Other people are like, ah, oh, typical Jerusalem. And Peter stands up and he starts to speak to them with authority and might. And the Holy Spirit within him starts speaking truth. And these people are like, wow. Something he is saying is resonating within me and something, something that I haven't really had before. And that's why 3,000 people from so many different parts of the earth came together and committed their lives to God. This is the church, the ecclesia, the congregation, the believers under a new covenant. Um, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. Essentially, they're like, what is this thing? I've, I've known Torah. I've known, I just forgot the word, but the uh, extended, um, I know the laws. I know all of that. But this is new. This is something, this is expanding on it. It's, it's building on top and it's bringing freedom. What is this? So they kind of had to, they had to devote themselves to the apostles' teachings. They had to like, be like, what is this? And the, I mean, the apostles, they... They, they lived with Jesus for three years. They, this guy spoke some whack things for the, that time. Like, like um, um, an example just escaped my head, but he, he really he challenged the norm. He challenged what people believed and what they thought. And um, like you live, like you work with uh, like a, someone that just like rubs you up a little bit at work and it's like, okay, thank goodness I can go home. But imagine living with someone who const constantly challenges your beliefs every day for three years, um, and suddenly you become like them. You're like, okay, fine, I understand what you're saying. You, you're bringing a lot more freedom. You're making a lot more sense. And this is what the apostles had. They had that anointing, that, that sort of sense of Jesus about them. And so when they spoke, they spoke like Jesus. They, they had his messages in his head and they, or in their heads, and they had the Holy Spirit within them reminding them of what Jesus had said and more. So constantly they, like, they, they are able to share. That's why, oh, that's why everyone was able to devote themselves to these teachings, these different things. They probably spoke things matter-of-factly and everyone else was like, whoa, mind blow. That is insane. I can't believe you just said that. So just by being around them, they, they learned and they, they, they growed. The apostles, they were the leaders, the shepherds, and the teachers of the church, as we know it today. And the word devotion here means like a conscious decision and effort to hear and learn and understand. So, I mean, the, these people, they, they could have just heard a fancy fancy thing and like just kind of moved on. Like, hey, you said things really cool in a really cool order um, and it sounded really cool when you said it uh, and I'm going to move on with my life. But it actually, there's a call to... I actually had to hear, learn, and understand, and then eventually apply it. And there had to be a response, and they, it was a continual process that they had with, with the apostles out there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, typically Jewish custom would see people going to temple or synagogue anywhere from three to three times a day to once a month. It was, it was really part of the, the, like the process to kind of go and learn and be with, around teachers. I mean, they had to pray, or well, there was three prayers that they had per day, and they required people to actually, actually say it. And so going to this local synagogue was actually a really good way to find a lot of people who had common belief and be like, hey, let's pray together. Um, I kind of can't do this alone. Um, and we see that they devoted themselves still to this, even though they had the new covenants, which is really... It's just fascinating. They continue to do what they did. You know, they had glad and generous hearts. They were uh, celebrating. And they, um, sorry, just trying to find that scripture. Day by day, attending temple together and breaking breads in, in their homes. They received food with glad and generous hearts. It's just, it just paints us like such an, a beautiful image of how it can look like people like going into temple, like ah, oh, praying, and they're just glorifying God, walking out, chatting, like just having a really good time, walking into homes, and then breaking bread and being happy because it's probably good bread. And just it just seems like a very utopious image. And we know humanity is fleeting, and we see how that eventually crumbles, and they, they start getting it, things get hard. but they still devoted themselves to the teachings and 
two meeting together and we kind of need to look at how we are doing it ourselves, how are we devoting our lives. So I don't know if we remember the sinner's prayer. I hope most of us at least have said it once. Um, it varies from person to person. But essentially you identify who Christ was, you identify what he did, and you, and you say, I dedicate my life to you. There's a dedication in that process. And part of that dedication, we, it's, a, it's a laying down. It's, it's a, essentially an altar in front of us when we give our lives and we plonk it on there and, and we give it on to him and we say, this is yours to control and take. And, when, and part of that process is a, a need for teaching, a need for feeding, a need for, for growth, and a need for understanding of who God is. Because he's just, he's essentially an infinite God. We are finite people, and we need to learn, somehow finite needs to learn about infinite. And that kind of doesn't really make sense. But there's always more we need to learn, and different people have different revelations, different people have different aspects, and angles on God. Like if you think about it, every one of us can live our whole lives seeing a single like concept of God. And if you took everyone from say the beginning of time, Adam and Eve, all the way to the end, end of the earth, everyone can have a revelation of God. And the sum of that together will never see the full image. And it just means that we can continually learn more and more. And everyone has a different side, and it's like it's such an awesome way. It's like a soup; you just keep on adding ingredients, and it just gets better and better. So, with yeah, with their model of having the apostles, you know, the apostles kind of just they taught, they shared knowledge. I mean, three years is a long time, but it's also not that long. They had the Holy Spirit within them that they were able to part like give over and um, bless others with and that spread and that would taught, teach. You know, we see Paul almost becoming an, oh, he became an apostle after the fact. Uh, he became an apostle uh, without having really walked the road with Jesus. So we just see that the Holy Spirit is there and it's teaching, it's constantly guiding us. And our model of church has, you know, it's, it's somewhat changed. We, we no longer visit synagogue three times a day. We don't we're not confined to praying only with people three times a day, or we, we don't. But we do meet here on Sundays. We do meet once a week, and we meet in the middle of the week as together as a as a family. And this model's shifted. It's changes changed throughout the years. It's changed from the time here in Jerusalem, and uh, and it, I believe it's going to probably look very different in a hundred years. But it's just the way that God guides His church. And but there are these elements that stay the same people that God puts and ordains and um, appoints to teach and share. We have the fivefold ministry, and one of them is to teach. And we need to be able to sort of devote ourselves to that because it's a, it's a devotion in our process of life. It's a devotion in our, in our walk with Christ to learn more about him. And sometimes it helps having a... Th- not sometimes, it does help having an extra voice saying, just, sorry, just giving us an image of how, an, an, another angle and another, um, another point of view. And we need to be able to trust whatever we hear within a church of this yeah, context um, and just be like, okay, I hear that. We take a, a responsibility on ourselves, sort of, to, sort of take what we hear and be like, okay, is this... This is what I know to be true in the Bible, and then from there apply it into our lives. Uh, Debbie talks about the head to heart to hands model. <laughs> so what we hear and understand and comprehend in the message, we need to be able to make it applicable to ourselves and just be like, hey, how does this apply to me? How does, how is this, where does it convict me? Where does it cut me? And then it needs to become, it needs to go to the hands, it needs to become practical. Otherwise it just becomes a fancy, Fancy message that another really awesome pastor said, and then we walk out, have coffee, and carry on with our lives. But if we don't have that three-stage process of it becoming practical, suddenly we're not devoting ourselves to teachings anymore. We're not, 
are we not grasping the message? Are we not moving forward with it? And we need to be able to be devoted to our local church. The, it's something that's near to us, where we have our community, where we have our people. And it actually means devoting ourselves to attending, even when times get tough. Like, if there's a race in Cape Town, it's just like, you just sit extra long in traffic, and like, is this worth it? And it's just devoting ourselves, pushing through and pushing through and pushing through, and actually meeting here and being with the ecclesia, the family, the congregation, despite difficulty. Um, I'll be honest, I, when writing the sermon, I sort of reached this point, and I just felt all this like, ah, urgency and understanding, but I was just left with a question of why. <laughs> why? Why do they devote themselves? Why? Why do we devote ourselves to the church? Why do we devote ourselves to God? And why is church so important? Why is gathering on Sunday so important? It's, it's essentially a bit of a social club. You know, why did the early church drop everything they had? They, they probably came there with a day pack and be like, okay, I'm, I'm staying here for the night. I'm going to offer my things and I'm going to move on and go back home. But why did they drop everything and say, no, I'm going to stay. I'm going to learn. If you think about it there, so many of them had come year after year, three times a year, coming to the temple, offering, 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 hearing about God, hearing about God, seeing where the holies of holies is. You know, seeing it's like situated way beyond, like way beyond where they could actually get to it and... All of a sudden, when Peter speaks, the Holy Spirit within him reaching and going around the crowd and actually touching people's hearts, suddenly they experience the divine. Suddenly they experience this God they've been hearing about for so long, and that just made them hungry. And they're just like, it's no longer about these traditions, these rules, these things we have to get right. It's about, I get to meet with my Maker now. I experienced my Maker. So we just see from the just the beginning of time, you know, Genesis isn't just a pretty story you start our our, um, our year through or a Bible in a year with. It's 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 a story of God creating relationship and giving autonomy and um, not autonomy, just um, freedom of will to things that He wants to love and to have love back. And then just shoving that freedom in, the, in his face and continually driving a wedge. And throughout scripture, we just see God consti- continually trying to get back to us and get in relationship with us. But no, we just we turn on him over and over and again. We just drive a wedge deeper and deeper and deeper in between us and God. But all of a sudden, he's like, he pulls out the, the trump card and he, he sends his only son. It's actually, you know, <laughs> I die for our sins that, and for our, our rebellion. Like, he saw what we did, and he was like, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm going to do something more that's going to undo everything. It's not going to, sorry, not undo, just it's going to pay for everything you've done so that I continue, can continue and get back to that place in the garden. And they sensed that. They sensed that there in Jerusalem on that day. They sensed God. They sensed him again, and it was... It was personal. You see in Romans 8 it says, For we did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witnesses, witness with our spirit that we are children of God. There's an inkling inside of us, a, a deep desire, a hole, a void that can only be filled by God. And that is why we devote ourselves to him. Because he fills that thing that we need, that deep desire of God, that creator, that divine eternity. And suddenly we don't have to be God and we can leave it to someone else and we can just be in direct relation with him. That's what drove them to devotion and it should be what drives us
I don't know if you remember the first time you gave, gave your life to God. For me, it was probably somewhere in my fours or fives years, like very young. And I don't remember the exact time I, I phrased it, but I remember in my matric year, rededicating my life. And then later in my 20s, rededicating my life again. A continual process of saying, God, I'm sorry, I've taken my life. Oh God, I'm sorry, I've, I've abused this relationship we have. And continually giving it back. Continually more and more and more, just letting him fill me. Now, and do you remember your first love? That, that sweet moment of God, you are awesome. God, you are amazing. You are all I've ever wanted. And then you go out and you scroll through Instagram. And, then, and suddenly it's like, ah, oh, that person has really cool shoes. And it's like, ah, oh, that car looks pretty cool. I'm sure mine does not have heated seats. Is it, is it, and suddenly we get wrapped up again in the world. And it's just like it drains us. And we try and stuff things into this massive void that can only be filled by God with, with Nikes. And that's, that's sort of where I really, really felt we needed to kind of end this morning was this rededication. Either if, it's, if you haven't had the chance to dedicate your life or if you just need have a need to rededicate or even if you want to celebrate your dedication, celebrate it together and be like, oh God, I've, I've walked this dedicated road for so long and I just... I've just seen you come through in so many ways. I just, I just want to celebrate you, the remembrance of you, Yanis. Um, as we, I just feel we need to go back into worship and either celebrate it or say, "No, God, I want to rededicate. I've, I've missed the mark for so long." Or if you want to dedicate it afresh, we're going to start off with first communion and then. I want to just open a, a chance to, you know, just have, you know, just give people a chance to say what they want to say with God. And we'll have, we'll have people up front, uh, small group leaders and elders, um, once we finish with communion, uh, just to, you know, just pray with you, just agree with whatever you have in your heart and say to the Father what you wanted to say. If, it's, if, if your heart is overflowing with thankfulness, thank God together. If your heart is just sorrowful and just you just so desire to be reconnected with the Father and rededicate your lives and do that together as well. And if, it's, if you've never really vocalized those words, you've, you've wondered about it, you've always, always thought like, oh, who is this God that everyone keeps on talking about? Who is this? What, what makes these people so crazy? And please, I really want to encourage you to do that as well. Just come up. You don't need to know what to say. It will flow up out of your heart. are being handed out I really felt to bring back a, a good old piece of scripture we've all probably heard it probably at least once there's a good chance of it God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him whoever believes in him is not condemned whoever 
but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment the light has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hate the light and does not come to the light, lest his works be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may clearly be seen that his works have been carried out in God. And it's that love, that love that drove Christ to come to earth, to walk a road with 12 burly men, and then to die on a cross as a sinner. And so we just remember that together, that, that cross, that, that painful death, so unjustly done, so unjustly earned. He did it without complaint, without, without fighting back. He did it because it was necessary. So as we eat the, the cracker, the the way for the body of Christ. We just remember what was what was broken, what was whipped, what was spit on, what was pierced. as we drink the grape juice signifying the wine that Jesus passed around at the last supper this just symbolizes the blood that was spilt because the cost of sin is death there needs to be blood that is spilt and Christ's perfect blood that was spilled because of our rebellion now as we drink the little, little sip let us just remember what what he's done for us the worship team carries on and when she goes into a song could the small group leaders and elders just form a row in front and if there's something on your heart you just want to lay at God's feet if you'd like to dedicate your life anew or you just feel you need to rededicate if there's anything else on your heart you just feel you need to bring up before the Father bring up within community and with with someone else I really want to encourage you to do so thanks Janice